Wow, he's a mime. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. Silent Mike. Holy Mike. There can be only one. They're here. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. And welcome to Cinema Royale. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape. This is the podcast where we keep it classy most of the time. I don't guarantee that. Um, here we go. I'm going to introduce you to the brotherhood of cinema here. First up, we've got James Sullivan, also known as Hi Me Dude. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by Patrick William Blouser, for some reason sending me the official soundtrack for the Woody Woodpecker movie over Facebook. <laughs> Everybody's heard about the bird. Bird, 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 uh, with with the the surfing bird track on there, and uh, I just responded with saying you're a bastard, <laughs> and he responds with, "Ha ha! I feed on your anger. I love this movie." <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, we've got Cody Klusner. Hey. Uh, just to let you know, everybody is doing this of their own free will because there is definitely not someone standing off the side of the camera holding a shotgun to my head. No, not at all. I'll do what you say. I'll do what you say. <laughs> yep, uh, we are here to talk about. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Oh no. Oh no. Uh, oh no. What the? I'm getting an incoming signal here. Damn it! I told him to part over. I told him to part over my house. There's the echo again. There's the echo again. The echo? What echo? I'm not hearing my it. Echo. My echo. <laughs> oh, hello. Whoa, hello. Coast of uh, no, We have a <laughs> what we have a we have an invasion? Wait, what? From the Fox Tribe of Morgan. Um did you plan this, Mike? No, did you? I that, I, Should I accept? I think you already did. Did I see him or the back of his head? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Hecubus, you can cut the sound. Hecubus, cut the sound. Cut the sound. Hecubus, Hecubus. Okay, 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 okay. Okay. <sighs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Greetings, greetings. I am invading your primitive podcast. For I not be wearing a regular turtleneck sweater, but I am... Mock Turtle. <laughs> okay. You can't have a podcast about villains if you're going to be talking about... Villains? Mm hmm I see nothing has changed ever since I left this puny thing you call a podcast. Not much to say, except wherever the hell you drag out of what freak show this thing came from. They just took all the hair out of the shower drain and brought me to life. That's all. Mm. Yeah, we brought him on board because he's like Matt, only with the hair going coming out of the chin instead. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. There's just one thing you don't have that I do have. Gen X Backscratcher resurrected in my own hands! It's back! It's back! 
Oh, that's evil. <laughs> that is evil. That is evil. <laughs> this is what I truly love to call the pit of alternate darkness. <laughs> Damn oh, it. and it gets better. It gets better. My chair. It's not even a chair anymore. It's a rolling chair. I can go this way. I can go that way. And the best part is she vibrates. Uh, there we go. It's a nice massage, uh, massage chair. <laughs> Morgan, you left your vibrator on. <laughs> Thank God it has two settings. Ah! Oh. Wow. <laughs> oh my God! Okay. Um. Um. Wow. Surprised? It's very surprised. Thank. Yes. I'm speechless. <laughs> Uh, so, what I was trying to do in this episode is a open discussion about movie villains. Note set villain per person. We just get to openly talk about what makes a good villain, what are the characteristics of a villain, and uh, maybe name off some movie villains that are worth checking out if you haven't seen the movie of. Ironic because there is one I did see recently this week, which has a surprisingly good villain played by Michael Shannon. And before you ask, it's not Man of Steel. Thank fucking God. Okay. okay. I will find him! I will find him! Give me Superman! Oh, and while we're on the subject of being evil, Cody. She said she was over 18, I swear. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about the dead hooker in the trunk. He's, not, he's hey, talking hey, about hey, your surviving hey, fan fiction. Her name is Rosie, okay? Get it right. Your ass is grass for tearing apart one of my favorite guilty pleasures. <laughs> you did watch it. You did watch that. Holy shit, he's fucking... He fucking watched that. Oh my god. He <laughs> <laughs> fucking watched the... the, the... Somebody's been it's, listening somebody's been to the listening. podcast. It's, 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 okay. Listening. <laughs> it's okay, baby. I still love you. Uh, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but no. Matilda Ney has never looked good in Blu-ray. <laughs> Especially, I will give him that. She was hot as hell covered in blood. Oh, she Damn. was. She was. <laughs> This is why movies are made. Um, so, yes. So, an open discussion podcast about villains and what makes them work. Or don't work. There's some really bad villains out there. Mm, that I can answer try... <laughs> Not surprised. Um, well, it, it, it... I say it depends on degree of villainy that you're that you're going for sometimes sometimes in a, in in a in a film it's it's all the more interesting to watch a villain who's got a, who's got a complex narrative or on the on the flip side of that we also have to we also have to agree we also have to admit this some some villains are just evil because they are. Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't need a. They don't need anything compl more complex about what happened in their childhood or what have you. They, uh, they can just sit there and ham up the the reasoning, uh, for whatever, uh, for whatever, whatever it is. Um, I, I, uh, I believe uh, recently Morgan and I here we uh, we watched. Uh, uh, the spy who loved me, which um, Bond films are great, but if you if you look at uh, them from movie to movie, especially especially with uh, especially with the older ones, uh, the Roger Moore series, they're rather 
they are rather exchangeable, interchangeable villains uh, to a, a certain degree. Goldfinger really stood out because... Go on. <laughs> because Sean Connery grabbed that ass. Um... <laughs> he didn't just grab it. He slapped it. And he called it by her name, Dink. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But anyway... Goldfinger stood out because uh, uh, because he was uh, uh, he was an, an interesting first uh, campy I should say campy villain of the of the Bond series. Uh, he had his own theme song and everything. And that's why everyone remembers him. Outside of that, though, how many can you name? These are just guys with uh, these are just guys with uh, generic goals of getting power and. Uh, well, there's Dr. No, there's Evil Donald Pleasance, there's Mysterious Wheelchair Guy, Jaws. Jaws is a henchman. Henchman. Is yeah, it? but, you know, he's... He, when you really do think about it, he really carries the weight of that movie for a good majority of it. How many times does the real villain of The Spy Who Loved Me appear in the movie? Really think about that. Mm-hmm. By interchangeable, I also mean, if you look at that in the film that followed Moonraker, uh, they both have, the the villains of both films kind of have a, a very similar goal. Now, one in one case, in The Spy You Love Me, it's a guy who wants to wipe out a life on planet Earth and build an entire civilization under the sea. And the Moonraker, it's a guy who wants to launch a bunch of uh, perfect people out into outer space, nuke the sur uh well, not really nuke the surface, but gas out all the human life on the surface, and then rebuild from there. So, the same movie, back to back, just in a different location. Except Jaws is more of a Looney Tune in Moonraker. Mm. That is true. Hey, at least he got somebody at the end. I, I can't believe they played the Romeo and Juliet sting there when he's... <laughs> That's so... Yes, Mr. Life, at last I found you. So... I just love his teeth from removable, because if he ever went down on her, that would, be, that would actually hurt. Oh, oh, oh. Well, well, wait, wait, let, let's, let's pause, let's pause for a second. Even if he is going down on her, he can just leave the teeth in because he can just use his tongue. <laughs> oh, that's true. But then there's no eating oh. out. Oh, Jerry, you've got two settings on that thing. <laughs> <laughs> See, it all comes full circle. So, well, maybe the teeth aren't the only thing that's metal. Ah! ah. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, baby, you gonna need double A batteries for this. <laughs> well, that, here's to us. <laughs> that does bring a good point. I'll drink to your leg. <laughs> this, uh, Bond villains are definitely the most, probably the most memorable when you think about it, because they try to take over the world in some way or destroy something, and Bond has to save the world in a way to stop them. So. Mm. I mean, when I'm looking for a villain, the first thing that comes to mind are two things. There's two variations that usually come to mind. There's the one that has, like, a reason for being a villain, which makes him sympathetic, where you can just rip out the sympathy and just make him appear a villain. Just out of nowhere, kind of deadweight villain. And I think a good way to counter on that, and bear with me here, this is a weird example, but please hear me out, The Shining really think about that when you're reading the novel you have the father character who's the conflict of all not the villain but the conflict i know this is different but really think about this here in the novel he's sympathetic he has a drinking problem he's trying to get over it um it's mentioned that he had a history of having some mental problems and he attacked like one of his students when he was working as a teacher once yeah that happened and so Throughout this book, him and his family are looking over this house, and at the same time, he's going slowly insane because he hasn't got a bottle of Jack to drink upon, and he's pretty much just cooped up alone, and these spirits come in and stuff like that. 
And it pretty much turns into more of a redemption story than it really does being a horror story, when you think about it. Now, let's look at the Kubrick version. What's the first thing that comes to mind? All that Jack needs is some Jack. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Jack by, by making the father character less sympathetic, we see him as this normal human being slowly deteriorating into a wild animal. And by the time we get to that ending, the tables sort of turn. It's not the house that's the villain, it's the father. And even then, they do psychologically play around with that, depending on what version of the movie you see, because I know the UK version trims like 20 minutes out, and it changes the entire meaning of the film. Um, but that's mentioned always... the third cut of the film. Oh, uh, yes, with the, the lost ending, which we'll never speak of again for reasons. Uh, I was talking about the one they made for the child actor in the movie. Oh, I didn't know. You that. never heard of that? No, no, I didn't. Uh, Stanley Kubrick um, uh, filmed and put together the movie, but he wanted to make sure that there was a, a version. Uh, he wanted to make sure that the child actor who played uh, Danny wasn't uh, wasn't left out of the watching experience. So he simply had the had the movie secretly recut strictly for him and um, cut out anything that was remotely terrifying. Hmm. Hmm. I'd love to see how that ended up. Um, it's the top secret. But basically, I think the big question is, at the end of the day, do you want to sympathize with your villain and feel bad for him at the end, or do you just want to see him go out and be evil? Well, um, what, um... I mean, I, can, I think... We can, we can, uh, go on. We can, we can either fear the Frankenstein monster or pity the creature from the Black Lagoon. Well, the, I thought you were supposed to pity them both. <laughs> well, that is until Bride of Frankenstein. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I say... Uh, I say that there there is a balance. It depends. It depends on your medium. I was having this discussion... I was having this discussion with a coworker last year. Uh, of course, we had to, of course we had to bring up Star Wars because likely when you're working at Target, there's going to be there's going to be at least two people there uh, uh, in any given retail position who know a thing or two about Star Wars. But I'm ch I'm chatting it up with uh, this one guy, and he brings up a very interesting very interesting point Darth Vader is a terrific is a terrific villain because um, uh, because he's in control or at least we think we think he is when we when we see the first movie a new hope we only see him uh, we see him with all with all the power and all the might, and all the... He's got control of the situation. And as the, as the films go on, we're slowly and slowly more, more so introduced to the Emperor. And that's when we realize Darth Vader is, is not in control at all. He's weak. He's a pawn. He's completely being manipulated. And... Uh, that's when, and and when you realize that your that your villains have that much depth to them, uh, what appeared what appeared frightening at first, uh, once stood up to can be nothing. Hmm. Well, if I may say something, I gotta say if you're gonna do a standalone movie, then. No need to make your villain sympathetic, unless you plan on making them sequels and bringing back because you gotta make them more interesting. Case in point. Uh. Well, yeah, he did. Pen... Well, Penhead kind of. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Well, as I was saying, when you first see him, he's just you know he's the hell priest of some dark dimension that's coming because you opened a puzzle box with his minions. You don't know much about him. He's got an interesting look, and he's just creepy and intimidating as all hell. But if you're going to create more sequels, then you're going to have to give him a backstory, you know, where he came from, how he came up the puzzle box, and all that stuff. 
I guess to get the backstory where he was a, a Vietnam veteran, I think. Mm-hmm. Thank, uh, so I, thank God I didn't see the sequels then. <laughs> well, the third one's pretty good. Uh, Two's a good follow-up. Three, eh, I prefer four over three myself. Oh, four. Oh, that was... Well, uh, for the record, the movie, the fourth movie is directed by Alan Smithy. So there's a red flag right there. But from what I was able to find out, there was supposed to be a whole lot more to that movie than what we got. It was supposed to be a whole lot better. Uh, if we were, were suddenly led to believe that the, the whole Pinhead mythos is... Uh, has gone on for generations and generations uh, long before the 70s even, long before uh, long before Pinhead technically should have been a thing. And uh, and uh, they're all being he's, uh, uh, he's being fought in every generation by a lineage that just happens to be to be played by the same actor and look exactly the same one generation after the next. Well, in that actor's defense, he does try to play each character differently. I, I still see the same actor. <laughs> I think adding on to that, too, another example that um, you brought to mind, Cody, Biff from Back to the Future. Mm. Oh. I, I was thinking about that, actually, because that's one of my favorite movies. Because mm. he, he, he starts off as a bully, the ultimate bully. He has it all, and then when the timeline changes because of Marty's undoing, he becomes a loser. And so in the sequels, it's kind of played around a little bit. So instead of his timeline where his ancestors get stronger and stronger, they get weaker and weaker. And that comes full circle in the third one when Mad Dog Tannen becomes literally the, the ultimate shit joke, pretty much. Because mm-hmm. that's when the cycle completely starts with him pulling the manure and stuff. The second one I find... I have an on... I have a... This is funny because I don't hate the second film, but I kind of have like an on-off thing with it. Let me explain why. Mm Because the first half of the movie is all about the future. And then it goes into what it's like tampering with the past and changing the timeline if it was in the wrong hands and stuff. And I feel like there's two movies in here and it's not connecting that well. But I'm not writing off as a bad sequel because there are some good ideas or some good concepts. And I like these good concepts. I just felt... In terms of a streamlining story, I thought the third one did that a tad better, even though there was a little bit of a repeating value, just a couple things switched around here and there. I mean, I'll give the second one this much. Is there ever a time travel sequel that actually goes back to the original and revisits moments from the past? That's actually kind of cool. And I do admit, the second movie is all about Biff. It's all about his reign, what happens if he had control of it all, when he becomes the ultimate the ultimate baddie pretty much if everything was done in his hands it becomes pure hell and that's just an interesting concept um but like i said i don't think part two is a weak or bad sequel i just don't see it as an equal as the first one or even the third one for that matter i I think i like the third one a tad a little more i have again i have an on and off thing with the back to future sequels i love the first one the other two they're like They're good, but not good as the first one, but I do think it's kind of interesting how they're going deeper into the history and timeline of these characters, who they are, and with, again, the timeline changing, when you really sit down and look all of them together, there is a unique pattern going on here. You're seeing the background and the history of each character and who they are and how they become as they are. And like I said, in the case of Biff, it's interesting to see how in the original timeline, he's you know, the one who gets it all, and yet in the other two, because the timeline is changing, his ancestors become the bottom pit. Yeah, I... I I have to say, though, remember, part two gave us Future Day. If it wasn't for that, we would never have... Yeah, it's it's (laughs) cool-looking, it's nice-looking, but at the same same time, it's like, I kind of wish the movie was more around that in a sense it feels like as if they just use that as filler for act one and then the plot gets going in act two and three i'm not writing it off as a bad film i just wish i I just wish the plot was a little stronger and and that's the problem i don't know how do you make it stronger Mm -hmm. and and it gave us pepsi perfect yes ah but it never gave us flying cars it never gave us jaws 19 it never gave us mr fusion 
it gave us Skype. And if you look hard, hard enough online, you will find self-tying shoes. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 you're wrong on that one because it was Max Hedrum that gave us Skype. Oh. Ah, ah. touche. So, ha! Touche. <clears throat> Last. <laughs> no, no, that's one of the. Nice try. I made a list like villains I wanted to talk about, and Biff was like right on the top of the list because he was the ultimate baddie for me in my head growing up. Because I was twelve when I first watched Back to the Future, I was like, oh wow, he's, he's such a jackass, and you realize he's a rapist too, raping uh, Lorraine in the car in the fifties in the first movie. It's like whoa, whoa. And the, yeah. And the second movie is just like because old Biff goes in the past to give him the almanac and he becomes Donald Trump basically. <laughs> and I, I'm I'm friends with Tom Wilson on Facebook too. He's such a nice guy. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I believe it. <laughs> He's so cool. Um. So, uh, but yeah, the uh, I, I I was kind of. I always kind of um, was surprised a little bit about the about the second uh, the second movie. I was always awed by the uh, the future aspects, but as in terms of uh, Biff, um, I always uh, I always thought at first it was strange that um, uh, that okay he's just a bully, but necessarily if you gave a if you gave a a bully too much power is this is this the type of person it becomes essentially somebody who's psychopathic yeah well thinking about it yeah because uh if you a bully is a bully but if you give a bully a gun they're a criminal well, put it this way, it's almost like um, It's a Good Life, that Twilight Zone episode where the little kid played by Bill Mummy, when he has too much power in his hand, my god, he gets way too much power in his hand, he goes absolutely ball to the wall with it. <laughs> He's like, if you're not on that hit list, you're dead, man. It's the same thing with Biff. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Sam McFly with the same gun. <laughs> Thomas Wilson, you're fucked up. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, hey, it's the perfect story for criminal. This ain't criminal minds here, man. This is America's most wanted. <laughs> Call the cops. I own the police. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. Okay, that I will call bullshit on. Yeah. Too yeah. much power there. Way too and much, which makes them. Ugh. But, but there is a case when too much power can backfire. Cody, you're wearing a good example. Davros from Doctor Who. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh. <laughs> wait, 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 <laughs> wait, 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 mm -hmm. They're bringing out the salt shakers. <laughs> Davros, I got your Daleks. I got your Daleks, Davros. I got your Daleks. There's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> Only one weapon can stop this. I got stairs. <laughs> retreat, 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 retreat. I mean, yeah, it's not just movies. There's a lot of villains on TV as well. I mean, for those who don't know. For those who don't know, they retconned the Daleks in the doc in the Tom Baker era to be created by Davros, this mad scientist who's pretty much a Nazi general if you show up a cone up his ass. <laughs> Which is don't pretty much the to all of them? <laughs> Yeah. Um, Wasn't it Klaus so... Garvey that said, I want to sit the cone up here? <laughs> I guess you could say that. Um... But no, the fact that he's so mad and insane with power, the fact that he creates these things and think he could create the ultimate, you know, power out of these, and he realizes there's one big flaw. He creates something that is supposed to be perfect in every way. Perfect in any way. Heartless, unstoppable, and has no share of pity. Without spoiling what happens at the end of Genesis, the dogs being very light on it, he realizes the creation he created is so despicable and hateful 
They don't give a shit who their creator is. They'll kill him either way. And that makes it all the more horrifying. Of course, that doesn't explain how in the world they brought his ass back from the dead. Because that's what you do. Yeah. So, so, so sometimes it shows what happens when you have too much power in your hands. It literally comes back and corrupts you. It makes it all more interesting. Mm -hmm. Very much. So cool. You know, if you do that too much, you're going to break your teeth. Just saying. Ice is ice. I like it. Okay. Um, oh, it melts in my oh. mouth, not in my hands. <laughs> to can play this. <laughs> oh my god. Um, we did mention Hellraiser, and there's a lot of horror movie icons that are villains, and those could be very much talked about a lot, like... The, like the slashers like Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers or even like Freddy Krueger for example those are interesting cases where like I said sometimes oh I realize I'm, I'm probably muting underneath there but I dropped my Reese's cup um, yeah you're good uh, those are cases where strangely enough the uh the villains became the heroes. It was such a it was such an odd phenomenon. And I think maybe that you know what maybe that actually started uh, way back in the day with the with the Universal monster movies. I mean, can you remember much about Van Helsing and and Dracula, or do you remember Bella Lugosi? I think I remember them both, but definitely Lugosi a little more. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Thing and that's that's kind of how villains have always have always been, um, with uh, with uh, the later horror uh, the later horror uh, villains Freddy Krueger Jason Voorhees. Um, nobody cared about uh, nobody cared about who the uh, who the heroes were. Nobody cared except maybe Tommy Jarvis. For a little bit, mm -hmm. um, nobody cared uh, from from movie to movie whether or not um, uh, uh, whether or not such as uh, this uh, this person was going to survive. It was just, it was just going to be a, a set group of teens. Maybe one of them survives, and that's the one that takes out the takes out the villain for the next movie. And those are the villains that we like to that we like to hate because Freddy is a ham. <laughs> Such a wonderful ham. He he like uh, he delights in messing with with his victims uh, to the point where you the uh, where you the viewer are on his side and cracking up with him, at least in the later films. Because uh, he's uh, what he, he turns into, it, it, he, he turns that one kid's uh, nightmare into a into a uh, a comic book uh, story. <laughs> that was a little that was a little bit silly, but I remember that moment. I don't know. I think my favorite one's when he turns into a television set because the antenna kind of move a little bit. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> um. Yeah, that's the, probably the only time that the villains are actually celebrated in, with those horror movies, to be honest. I mean, otherwise, you know, you have the villains in those action movies or even whatever. They don't, you like the love to hate or, you know, that sort of thing. And it's got an odd just... fascination all the way from the beginning. I think um, the very first horror movie ever made, does anyone know who that, know what that is? Is that Einstein's Frankenstein from 1910? A Trip to the Moon by George Millier? Mm, nope. That's for Act 2. Um, the first, hor first designated horror film on record is uh, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Oh! Damn. Mm hmm. Which, uh, for those of you who are not aware, 
is a si- is a silent movie about uh, a somnambulist uh, who visits a, a small village to put on a show, but what he doesn't, and uh, for those who don't know, a somnambulist is a technical term for a, a sort of wizard magician whose trick is that he brings uh, uh, corpses to life and has them has them do his bidding. But what they don't, but what he doesn't tell people when they're when the, he's uh, when they're uh, when he's doing his show is that um, at night he sicks his uh, monster out to find victims. So he bring so he brings this thing back from the dead. It goes out, kills for, kills for energy or food or what have what have you, or maybe it's just because Doctor Caligari is evil and that's what. They don't really do a good job of explaining it, but here's the twist. In the end, uh, I'm not spoiling much. You can watch the movie anytime you want. Mm-hmm. Um, in the end, uh, it turns out. One of the first and biggest twist endings ever in cinema. Uh, the hero uh, manages to stop the doctor and uh, and the monster, and in the process, uh, almost loses his uh, almost loses his lady love. And uh, when we we think we get a happy ending, but then Iris out, Iris back in, and we realize that the hero has been telling this story this whole time to someone else in a mental home. Hmm. And yes, the hero is is a crazy person in a mental home who's been telling us this, this whole story all along and everyone else in the mental home is, uh, uh, is a character from his story. They're all patients there, and then finally he snap. Uh, he snaps when he sees Doctor Caligari again, who happens to be his therapist. Once he's sedated, uh, the movie ends with Doctor with the doctor saying, "Ah, so he thinks that I'm. He thinks that I'm the infamous Doctor Caligari. Now I know how to cure him." And that's the end of the movie. Dirk. Hmm. Huh. Oh. That is why. That is what makes villains interesting. Hold on. You know, it's a bigger villain. Hmm. The unknown. Yes. Are we speaking a film or a, a theoretical, or you know? Hmm. Well, if you want to do a mix of both, I'd say probably go with John Carpenter's The Thing because we never see what the creature's like. We yeah. never know who or what the creature is. We don't know its motives or ambition, even though it's kind of unclear and vague. It's sort of a case where we don't understand what's happening and we sort of fear the thing at the same time. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, this thing's going around in assimilating humans. How is it that friendly? Now, that would have been kind of an interesting bit of twist. Yeah, I hope you don't mind eating the crew and stuff like that. I just want to get back home. That's all it is. Well, that's the uh, that's the motivation right there. Your villain's uh, motivation is to live. True, but then you see the giant spaceship in the shed, and you kind of wonder how silly it could have been to see that guy who gets... Oh, spoiler alert. When one of the um, crew members gets locked on the shed and they reveal he was building a spacecraft the entire time, can you imagine him driving that thing around in modern day New York? That would be a little silly. <laughs> Maybe. Really think about that. Hmm. Yeah, no, uh. I was just going to bring up about how sometimes you don't even see the villain, you can hear, hear their voice. Um, one of my favorite that nobody ever talks about is. Phone booth for 2003. Oh, oh, that's, that's an collar. interesting one. I remember that. The caller yeah. with Keith or Selvin playing the caller and calls up Colin Farrell's character Stu and starts to threaten his life. 
and trying to tell him what to do while he's in the phone booth. You know, he's got to confess to tell the truth to everyone, but if Stu doesn't comply, you kill him. You know, it's kind of this cat and mouse kind of thing within one space, which I kind of like with... So, you know, it, you kind of do see him, like, towards the end for, like, a, like th less than three minutes. So you see... Keith, they put him on the freaking cover, Keith Sutherland, but you don't actually it's, see him in no, the movie. If you don't recognize him by his voice, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. But, he's, but it's a sniper. But see, here's the thing. The writer... I forgot the writer's name. So, if you can think of the writer's name. But he was thinking about writing the movie with Alfred Hitchcock in the 60s, but couldn't think of a way to do it. Until late '90s, when the sniper came to his mind, I was like, "You wrote wrote it less than a month." So. I uh, phone booth the day that uh, Jack Bauer went insane. <laughs> Same style as Twenty Four, so it's inspiration. Yeah. But yeah, like it's uh, think about it. It's uh, it uh, Jack Bauer does Jigsaw here. Basically, yeah. yeah. And I kind of like that. I mean, he's got that iconic mm -hmm. voice, and it's just like, oh, very villainy with his voice. What about what about when the villain is the hero? Sometimes that can be kind of interesting. Anti-hero? Uh, well, not, e out. not exactly. I mean, something more along the lines of, say, The Night Professor, where the hero creates an anti-version of himself. In a sense, or if you again, if you want to, go, if you want to go with the better example, Army of Darkness, Good Ash, Evil Ash. Ah. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, so something, some case where they inadvertently create some sort of anti-Kirk. Yeah. Or like um, um uh, the Midnight Meat Train. Anyone seen that movie? Oh, it's Mises. <laughs> Well, so long as we're talking about Raimi material here, right? <laughs> and this is a movie that clubbed uh, Ted Raimi in the back of the head with a meat with a meat uh, tenderizer. With a meat tenderizer, <laughs> made his eyeballs pop out. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. This is why I prefer ice cream, man. <laughs> Clint Howard, man. Clint Howard. Ah, uh, yes. He will always be Hathi Jr. How about when you don't realize that the villain is kind of like the wise mentor or something like that? I mean, when you really think about it, Willy Wong can be kind of a villain, too. His entire chalk factory is one giant yeah, saw trap. That, I was going to say, that's like a twist, because, because you can think about that in a different like aspect of it. It's like... You know, he seems nice on the outside, but on the inside, he's wacko. If you remove the happy ending aspect, you have a goose's glue being turned to fudge. Violet probably exploded in a juice. Brugus Saul and his dad are probably in the garbage chute. Mike TV is the size of a Tic Tac. <laughs> he yells at kids. And in the end, they fly up in a... In an elevator, they we never see them land. We never see them land. They just disappear into the clouds. I, I'm 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 gonna quote Rob, I'm gonna quote uh, Rob Walker. If it <laughs> he wishes he ended it ended this way, where Charlie pushes a button, it cuts to Walker. Walker says, "It's begun," and then just cut to black. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I still love that movie, regardless. Yes. Yes. Um, but if you just separate the darker aspects, it's like, wow. Here's, oh, you just reminded me, actually. Um, here's another, here's another villain for you. Um, and I think, uh, I think, uh, this is, this is also why I brought it up by sharing that video in the chat earlier today. Uh, oh, Annie yeah. Wilkes. Ah. <laughs> yes. Yes, he shared that video in the group chat, and it was just, I mean, watched it, I was like, and then I finally realized what it was about, I was like, holy shit, that's clever. I, I did a double take, I could not believe that was Kathy Bates. That's not... It wasn't, but it was some... That's not actually Kathy Bates. It was someone pretending... It looked, yeah, it looked like her. 
It's somebody putting on the character and doing a damn good job of it. Oh, yeah. 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 I was thinking, wait, what was the author she's looking for? I like, and I looked it up. I was like, ah! Misery by Paul Sheldon. <laughs> How can you have a library and not, not, not know who Paul Sheldon is? <laughs> How could you be? Well, I would store. just love to see what would happen afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the clerk's just like, oh, 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 order online for you. That, th those people are, those, those people in that, in, in, in that clip, they were saints to, for just playing along with this. Clearly, uh, this was a gotcha sort of prank. I know, and it was great. But, um, but yes, any Wilkes is, is the, uh, is a villain. And what, I, I, I always remember. I always remember Annie Wilkes um, when it comes to villainy because uh, because this is so, this is so, someone you would think is supposed to be good is supposed to be on your side, but this is this is every fan base, every major fan base out there, every major rabid fan base that hasn't been. That hasn't been um, uh, pleased with the way things with the way things have been since their favorite film franchise or favorite book franchise uh, changed slightly because George Lucas did something to Star Wars. It shows us our it shows us our ugly side when we react to that. God. This is... Because he never got out of the cock of duty Scarlet pit. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is what the this is what happens when when Chris Chan's take over your over your uh, your fandom. I wouldn't want to badge that. Uh, and uh, we have uh, we have to say, unfortunately, that uh, that there is there is this bad side. Uh, to fandoms, when you're when you're creating something that leaves a tremendous impact with the world, you're going to you're going to attract a lot of obsessive personalities as well. That's what makes that's what makes this character frightening. Mm -hmm. It could be very real. So she was a lot more psychotic and crazy in the book. I hear right. what you do. Well, oh, let's see. Um... Remember the scene in the movie where she's feeding him soup and she spills some on the blanket? In the book, she got a bucket and a sponge with soapy water, cleaned it up, and made him drink the soapy water bucket with the soap residue with the soup residue in it. Ew. And another thing she did, she um, when he commented about the typewriter not having a M or an N, one of the two, she cut off one of his fingers and, and stuck it onto a cupcake like a candle. And instead of just shooting the sheriff, killed them, placed them in the yard, and then ran a lawnmower over them. Because... Yeah, because she's just more crazy that way in the book. She's... Ah, I'm just glad they toned it down for the movie, because that, in my opinion, was a better, better choice. What would be the purpose of running him over with a lawnmower after you already killed him? Because she's crazy. She's insane. <laughs> she wants to be lawnmower man. Uh, <laughs> I, I think. Know. I don't care what I people think, say. Uh, Not related to the Stephen King book, but I like that, that movie. No, another uh, aspect is uh, animals can be villains, such as Jaws. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, but if I may, I may, might, yeah. Yeah. I'll be talking about the sequel. Let's just let it lie. Okay. Ah. Ah. Okay. Ah. Okay. Ah. One good thing about the uh, one good thing about the uh, uh, the comeback there is all of the old merchandise that it brought back. Hell, we now have the original movie on 4K. Yes. So, moving on though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. Animals. Animals as villains. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, they're creatures and they strike back and. Uh, what? Yeah, what is ex- what is exactly that Jaws got right that Grizzly didn't? <laughs> or any other ones in that during the era like Orca. Ugh. There was a killer Orca. Yep. Yep. Oh, I wonder how I missed that one. Oh, because they kill the mommy, and the mommy gives birth when her carcass is on deck, and they kick that fetus off the deck, and so the daddy worker gets angry and says, get revenge on each and every one of them to the point where he finds the owner and kills him in the Antarctic. Because... Studio. Oh, yeah, and it's, directed by, and it's produced by Dino De Laurentiis. Just mm-hmm. think of it as Moby Dick, but the roles are reversed. Mm-hmm. It's usually a lot of revenge. Don't you mean Dicky Mo? <laughs> Dicky Mo. I mean, most heroes have Dicky to... Mo. Dicky oh, Mo. Dicky God. Mo. Dicky you... Mo. You you had to reference that cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> Get on back with my world. Just, the just only one I liked. Uh, sorry. Sorry. No, I'm just uh, trying to think of other. Uh, what about Christine? Ah. Uh, uh, Cars as villains. Now there's a subtrope. Yeah. Or, 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 before the twist happens, was it the car? Or was it the teenager that was doing the killings? Really think about it. I'm pretty sure we, th- we were... Uh, we were meant to believe that it was the car. Yeah. Mind you... Yes. But, but, if the car was alive, you think he would be behind the wheel when some of those murders happened. Except the gas station explosion. I can't see how he survived that one. And the one fat guy. Yeah. But, um... Yeah, we both, we both know that, uh, Stephen King has used Christine as an excuse to get, a, uh, to get away with murder himself on a number of occasions, mainly Dean Koontz. So... <laughs> Actually, it kind of reminds me of Maximal Overdrive. Yeah. Oh yes, technology is the as the villain. Has anyone here seen the car? What? Oh, I have the Sven Gulli episode. I've seen parts of it. Mm-hmm. It's it's very much the same. It's very much the same idea as Christine. Only not even so much as a human host was needed. That's that's what I that's what I view Christine as is something that uh, is a a monster that needs a human host. You could also place aliens as villains as well. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, then again, wouldn't that fall somewhat under the animal creature category as well? Because they're not exactly animals. You, c- you could. They could count. They're. Spacely, and they're not even identified as cre- they're creatures, but not animals. But yeah. But then again, like they in... were created by an android that went insane. Could be. You never know what the alien's origin is. I mean, the evasion of the body snatchers is a great example. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, we now know what the alien's origin was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, oh. And I don't think uh, the results are mixed there. Uh, oh. Twilight Zone has a lot, a lot of good villains. Oh yeah, too many oh, to yeah. count actually. Even even some episodes star villains. The most especially un- that one with Jaws as the alien. Ah uh, yes, to serve man. Um, the one I always keep coming back to, oddly enough, is the episode four o'clock. That one has a guy that's like a conspiracy nut, and he's so determined to get rid of all the evil people. He doesn't realize that he's the ultimate evil. Should I ruin the twist? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay, okay, this depends on which version you're watching. But what the hell. Um, in the episode, he plans to shrink all the evil people at 4 o'clock. He, mm-hmm. he thinks some of them are communists. He thinks some of them are really bad. Um, and he keeps sending letters and stuff. You know, like, you know, internet, you know, conspiracy not wood. And at the end of the episode, it hits four o'clock, and as it turns out, he's the only person that's shrunken. 
But to add, to, to salt it so perfectly, if you listen to the radio version, the Twilight Zone radio drama version, which has Stan Freeberg as the main character, he has a parrot in both versions. And the parrot goes, Rack, not, not. And, Drink! Yes, and at, and at the end of the radio drama, you actually hear him get eaten by his parrot. Wow. Yeah. Talk about comeuppance. <laughs> Damn. He's hungry for a nut, so he's going to eat the nut. The nut that's been feeding him nuts all along. <laughs> okay. Let's see, who, who do we have as, a, as another villain here I can, I I can put up? I can also think of like comic book movies as well as a lot of major villains, either with Marvel or DC. Mm-hmm. Um, probably the most. Yeah, but Marvel movies with their villains, a lot of them are becoming interchangeable, like Bond villains too. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I can agree with that because Marvel has a rare villain case. I mean, DC has a lot more better villains, in my opinion. DC is like, okay, we got the Joker. You guys can't. Uh, you guys can't really top that. <laughs> Suck it. I mean, Heath Ledger as uh, the Joker is. You can't compete against that from The Dark Knight. That's ten years old now, and and Marvel is like, well, we have, we have the Green Goblin. <laughs> Looks like man, not anymore. From uh, it's okay. We still got Doctor Octopus. Oh yeah, he's with the fishes now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we uh, we screwed the pooch. Uh, so. Ah. Uh, but we brought back, uh, uh, but we hired Michael Keaton as the Vulture, so. Yay. Yay. Batman turned into the villain after all. Ha <laughs> ha! You know, you, know, you know, speaking of Bond villains, you know what the bit of irony is? Hmm. The Adventures of Tintin as Daniel Craig is a villain. Oh. Really, really, really think about that. And it's so not him either. Yeah. Still, he does a great job in that one. Oh, here's uh, here's something. Uh, bending the bending the rules a little bit. Uh, we've we've gone on about uh, we've gone on on about what we what we think of villains, and we've described so many different cases of ultimate evils here, or. Or hammy evils. Here's, I'm looking at a list here. Sorry, guys. Uh, Nurse Ratchet. I was in that play. I was in that play. <laughs> she is the least evil villain. Is that a, is that a villain? Or just a, or just a potentially corrupt person. Because, what exactly did she do? Has anyone, has anyone seen uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? Ooh, I was in it. <laughs> yes, you were the cuckoo. Um, Screw them all. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, with that case, um, that's just a, that's just a, a, a person who's doing their job. But I think it's the way the actor or actress portrayed the role is what sinks everyone, it sinks what everyone remembers, you know, how they acted. You know, like uh, Peck from Ghostbusters. He too is just doing his job. Oh yeah, but, also, but he's not the villain. Exactly, he's just an asshole who does his job. I mean, assholes could be in that category too. <laughs> <laughs> he's an asshole. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, uh, you might as well if if they're well if they're um 
if, if she's the villain, then you might as well chalk in, chalk in the uh, the doctors from I Am Sam as villains too, because they're just about as bad. Mm. I'm going to. We're going to take away your child because we think you're mentally incapable of raising a raising a child. <laughs> mm, government, government could be a yeah. villain too. <laughs> Uh Oh, there's so many movies there. It's not even funny. There's so many. I mean um some try to there's different motives to, you know, like of course the most common is like take over the world. Of course. <laughs> and Bison from Street Fighter. Mhm. Mm well, what is, we've uh, we've definitely seen a good deal of villains uh, here on my list. What are some more from your list, Mike? Um, you know, we mentioned Star Wars. Let's t take a look at the other franchise with a star in it, being Star Trek with Khan. Talking about the Wrath of Khan from '82, not Khan from Into Darkness. Because Captain Kirk and Khan's kind of relationship is hostile in a way. And it's just like, you know, Khan is always like taunting Kirk and it's always a great villain in my head that I can think of. Was it just how how he was acted? Mm-hmm. It's usually how the villain acts. That's the thing that makes the performance great. Um, for actor actress doing a villain role. I mean, some people say that doing a villain role is more fun being than a hero. Because you can, you can ham it up if you want to, or you can just, being evil is just fun to do. I think a good example is Jonathan Harris, when he was doing Dr. Smith on Lost in Space. It's weird because he started off as being very menacing, very intimidating. And then when they played his character differently in the later seasons... Oddly enough, he actually liked playing that angle because he liked being over the top. He liked being him because it fit his persona and what he wanted to do, being comedic instead of being sinister. But if you just look at those first five episodes of Lost in Space, my god, he's a perfect villain. <laughs> he, he nearly kills the, the Robinson family. He's always uh, intimidating the, the son, Will Robinson, about certain things he's always with the robot planning to like break out and do different things and stuff and then right after those five episodes he's just goofy cartoony dr sniff time and messing things up and going around and stumbling and causing all sorts of chaos so it's the dr smith and will robinson show yeah <laughs> i have never felt more calm in my life i am turning into a vegetable oh, leave god. me be oh god that fucking episode <laughs> It happened. It did. You showed it to me because you loved it. I do. So I did. <laughs> they, he, he goes to a planet that's entirely uh, that has living plants, and because he starts clipping some flowers, his punishment is to be turned into a plant. And later in the episode, he turns into this celery stalk version of Doctor Smith, with, like celery on his hair and everything. Mm-hmm. I remember, I think I had more fun showing that one to Matt because even he freaked out when Tybo appeared mm -hmm. the carrot guy. Mm -hmm. Willoughby, Willoughby. Uh, now, can you imagine Gary Oldman doing that? Oh man, I'd well, love to see that happen. He's a very versatile well, actor. You never know. Yeah. Very. Um, let's see. I'm just gonna name a couple of villains, and you can just stop me if you want to talk about it. Um. Dr. Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> Classic. Mm, not Norm much to say. Norman Bates. Okay, oh, let's talk what's about that. Yeah. Let's not talk about Freddy Highmore. Let's focus on, <laughs> on the original, please. And it's interesting, too, because... Oh, it's okay, it's okay. I have not seen that series. Uh... 
Uh, but it's interesting because Norman Bates is actually b loosely based on the killer Ed Gein, so that's kind of they take inspiration from real life killers and people to create a new character. Ed Gein is inspired over tons, tons, over, tons. over a dozen uh, movie villains. Mm -hmm. But um, it, yeah, the uh, Damn it. Norman. Norman Bates is the most, uh, is uh, definitely the most uh, down to earth uh, insp uh, inspired villain of the, of the character. You don't, uh, you don't, uh, you don't suspect him at first unless you've, uh, unless you've uh, seen the movie. He seems like a perfectly normal guy, perfectly nice guy. Bam. His mom's killing people, or is it him? We don't know till the end. Yeah. And then, like I've said before, uh, the whole motivation behind everything is not that. Uh, uh, is not uh, anything personal against this. Uh, uh, against uh, this lady or the or the other people that uh, got killed, it's just it's just uh, he was a mama's boy obsessed over his mother. I'm actually I'm looking at the AFI's 100 Years 100 Villains and Heroes and they do the top 50 uh, villains and uh, they also list the Wicked Witch of the West from Wizard of Oz Irony she was a teacher in real life <laughs> everyone's favorite school teacher yep. yeah I remember C she was so worried C plus <laughs> Oh, man. You know, funny thing, she went on Mr. Rogers once to show that herself as the witch was okay and stuff was all makeup and everything because she was afraid she'd be scaring little kids. And even then, when she replies her role for Sesame Street, she was still worried about that, too. Hmm. Which is unfortunate seeing how that episode is still lost to this day. Yes. Truly, really, truly really sad. I don't know, it was something about the Wiccan clan got upset, and they said kids were afraid of the Wicked Witch in the episode, so they did some test readings on the side after the episode aired to see what was going on and they got some really weird results like the kids are actually looking at the witch's green face like ooh green it looks so cool and green everything so they ended up junking the episode because they didn't know if the episode was really that problematic or if they were just getting like they they, they didn't get in a sufficient enough reactions to justify whether kids are being really afraid of that episode I think that's a better way to put it mm -hmm. it's the same thing when they did Snuffy's parents get a divorce that was an episode. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that happened. That happened. They shot it, they filmed it, they screened it, and the kids had like all these different reactions and stuff, and it was not the right message they were getting across, so all that had to get junked off. Because mm -hmm. I think at one point the parents are arguing and Alice like kicks her teddy bear and some of the kids are like, Oh my goodness, she's stabbing her teddy bear. Let's see here. Uh, the Exorcist, Reagan. <laughs> and uh, the she's not the villain though. It, I was because it says as possessed by Satan, so that's the that's the keynote is Satan. The devil is a villain. That that's da ha 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 ha. That's a that's a cop out. That's number nine uh, on the list. So um, here's the great villain. According to AFI, at least, man. Oh, I knew you. I knew you'd find that one. Yeah, but in Bambi. Yes, that's right. Man, man is incapable. Man is destructive. Man will go around and eat your children. That's right. Man will eat your children. <laughs> man will bring your, your wife around and fuck her. That's right. We'll fuck your wife. <laughs> Ah, uh, fuck you, Baltimore. 
<laughs> home of challenge pissing. That's right, home of challenge pissing. If you can swizz over the year and not get wet, you're the winner. <laughs> Go to Big Bob's Hell. Big Bob's Hell. Guaranteed. If you can find a better deal than we did, you can shove it up your ugly ass. That's right, you can shove it up your ugly ass. <laughs> now there's a villain right there, voiceover guys. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, why another another good villain? Society. <gasps> Logan's Run, THX one one three eight. Um, again, going back to Twilight Zone, the obsolete man. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, obsolete man. That's. Fergus Meredith, he's a librarian, he's being accused because he's obsolete, because he's all these books, and this guard's like, I'll show him, I'm better than him, and then Fergus Meredith's like, okay, I'm gonna bring you with me when I'm gonna get executed, and at the last minute, the guy chickens out, ducks out of the room for it, explodes, and then he's deemed obsolete, and I remember the last image is so frightening, yeah. all these people in the room's pouring him, and he tries to escape, and they'll turn like wild animals, like they start growling and stuff, and they just jump on him and pin him on the table. I... It's, just, it's just it's just the way it's shot is so horrifying. Yes. Mm-hmm. I do recall Yeah, I do recall that uh particular uh episode now. It's considered a classic. Mm -hmm. It's on Netflix. Oh yes. So season two, I believe. So you've seen a recent movie with a villain, Morgan, with Michael mm -hmm. Shannon playing the villain. Yes. Yes. Could you tell us what that would be? Oh my God! If this is in theaters at your neck of the woods, I say, full of God, go see it. It's The Shape of Water. It's directed by Guillermo oh. del Toro. <laughs> you, you've seen it? Yes. It was awesome thank god i'm not alone on this one i mm. did you notice something with the cinematography the way out for the first half it's tinted green and then yeah. right after the artist is told to switch the color the jellos the green tint's kind of gone wow it was, it was interesting so michael shan's in this film and he's running this underground facility and i'll try to avoid spoilers as best as i can mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as best as i can it's the evil government. More or okay. less. No, no, it's it's more than that. It's more than that. Um, I might give some minor things away, but hopefully it won't be too big. So Michael Shane plays the head of this agency, and he's looking after this project they captured from South America. Hmm, gee, I wonder what that could be. What exactly could come from South America? There's only two things that come from South America. Those bloody Rio movies and this damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah he captures an amphibian humanoid creature and even though it's part of his job he still hates his job and the only thing he likes about his job is the fact that he's getting paid for doing this sort of stuff and he gets royalties and all sorts of stuff so okay there's the aspect of greed that's one aspect of your film right there second of all he's without a doubt the most racist sexist cold-hearted son of a bitch you'll ever see on the big screen yes there's a scene where his kids go off to school and he looks at the wife and the wife's all like oh you know let's have some time with each other and stuff and she wants to get intimate not him no when he's doing it he covers her mouth he's like no no i like it silent. i like it silent. like holy crap and then even later that gets pushed further when he tries to intimidate the the main character who's a mute janitor might i add doesn't speak at all and he starts like hitting on her and stuff in a very predatory creepy rapey kind of way and he doesn't give a care he just wants to have her way with her thank god it doesn't happen but you can sense it almost does especially seeing how he purposely drops a glass of water just to get her just to get her attention this is a man who doesn't really care about fashion statements or anything he's more into what is there just for the sake of enjoyment? He constantly eats the slime green candy. Not because of the fact that he's indifferent to others like nougats and stuff, but the fact because it's made of minerals, it's full of sugar, he can just pop it in his mouth and enjoy it just because it's there. And that's really it. There's a bit where he goes to see like a, um, a Cadillac 
realtor or seller, and he's like, the, the seller's trying to get him onto this, like, lime green Cadillac, and he doesn't want to get it because of the color, but the Cadillac guy's like, no, no, you understand, this is the future, this is the next big thing, and that's the only reason why he gets it. He still hates it because of the color, but he only gets it because of the car and stuff. And then later, when the monster gets stolen, I don't think that's a big spoiler at all, because that happens, you know, in the trailer and stuff, his ass is on the line, because here he is, top of the world, everything's in his hands. Like, literally, he has great income coming in and stuff like that. Monster gone, no purpose for research, shut down the project, there go all his little benefits, there goes his little royalty check, there goes everything in between, his top-of-the-line stuff. His higher-up has a really good line. And, Cody, please, back me up this one. It's a really good line. When he's literally telling Michael Shannon, you done fucked up your job, so now you got to go fix it. And he pretty much tells him that there are points where there's an alternate universe. We start at the top, and then once we fall back, we find ourselves in this pit of nothingness, and we become nothing again. Yep. And that is so empowering, it literally summarizes Michael Shannon's character in a nutshell. He is even more cold-hearted than Biff Tannen. <laughs> and I want to say why? But it ruins something really, really big at the end. And, it, it, Cody, if you're wondering what it is, it's what he does to the scientist at the tail end. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say what it is, but... <laughs> yeah. That made me jump. I was like, holy crap. That is one mean son of a bitch. Yes. Oh, uh, is Guillermo del Toro... Uh, marking up people's mouths again like he did in Pan Pan's Labyrinth. Maybe. But we won't tell. Dot, dot, dot. You have to go see the movie to find out. Yes. This, okay. This, uh, it was weird because I was looking at Rob Walker's post and he was like, yeah, I kind of liked it. You know, amphibian creature and lady real okay. Michael Shannon was in. It's like, no, Michael Shannon is like, really yucking it up here he's playing to his heart as a villain and it's perfect and what i really like is how they don't mention his backstory they don't give him like motives or anything because it's all there right in front of you it's a visual telling of what his character is what he does what his interests why he's there he doesn't give two shits about his job the only thing he cares about is having a good paycheck and the american dream even though the american dream is just something he wants to live instead of embrace and that's what i loved about his character he's so cold-hearted he's so harsh he's just living it for the sake of living it not because he cherishes it but because he wants to be like those higher ups and be something couldn't put it better myself. Okay. And that's why I fucking love this movie so much. I, I cried yes. so many times. I, I, good God, I cried so much. Right. Especially at the end. Ah, uh, yes. <sighs> uh, <sighs> if only I, I had seen a movie recently that had the an equally compelling villain, but no. Oh, oh, are you I had to Woody? watch the I, Woody Woodpecker I, movie. <laughs> <laughs> He counts as a villain, doesn't he? He's but, a... but, uh... He's a <laughs> I'm sorry, James. No, Mike counts as a villain for sending for sending me the link to that. Uh... <laughs> what? You did what? Boy! You did what? Boy! What are you doing, my boy? Boy! What? What? What are you doing, boy? What are you doing, boy? What you do? I saw the movie was. I saw the movie was. Uh, what you do? I just sent. It's like, hey James, why don't you watch this movie? I watched it already. It's something. Check it out. And he just ended up watching it. You poor sad bastard. <laughs> well, Mike, it was already on Mike, Tim Cartoon by that point. Mike, so. Mike, yeah. Mike, 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 you do not know the meaning of pain unless you've seen the Book of Henry, and even that has a more intimidating villain, because yeah. it's the kid. I've heard of that, I've heard, I've, so, oh, I, I haven't watched, movie. yeah, I've, I've seen reviews of that, and, yeah, even. Seriously, this kid's supposed to be this Matilda child prodigy, and he has the instincts of a villain. Good God. Well, kids can be villains. Yes, that's well, another. Well, well when, when it's done right. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. The only example I can think of is the one in North, that's, but even that's a bad example. <laughs> oh. Seriously, he's living the dream. He's getting, like, a back massage from... Okay, that is kind of creepy the more I think about it. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on. I Growing see. up doesn't make you better. It just makes you old. It makes oh you smell god. worse in the morning. My god, he is a young Dick Cheney. Ah. <laughs> Actually, it does remind me of another one, The Good Son, with Ma Macaulay Culkin playing kind of a villainous, dark kid in the movie. I haven't seen that one. Yeah, he was kind of really crude to uh, Elijah Wood in that movie. I've only seen reviews. Oh, I, I, I'm, no, no. I understand where I was going, but no. <laughs> I mean, how could, you not, how could you not suspect him the way he acts? How could you not suspect he's the villain? I know. Hey, hey, let's go play with Mr. Highway Man. <laughs> um, I wanted to bring up an interesting case where uh, a villain turns to be a hero in the sequel. Uh, talking about the Terminator about Arnold Schwarzenegger because he plays both a villain in the first movie and a hero in the second movie and a hero throughout and that's well that's um, that's a, a very interesting case only because he's he's not a hero or a villain because of what he's uh, because of how he is as a person he's He's only that way because he's programmed. Mm -hmm. I mean, another example. Sorry. Go go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say two other examples that came to mind. You have Scrooge, who starts off being very anti-social and stuff, and the other one, of course, is the Frankenstein monster. Again, Bride of Frankenstein. He starts off as this cold-hearted creature, just pretty much created in the first one. In the second one. He just wants to be loved like Peter Boyle. <laughs> but I'm the rich. <laughs> you are not evil. You are good. <laughs> that that scene is so beautiful. You know, it is. It's it's it just, is. It's it's it it's it's funny. It's it's tear jerking at the same time because when you think with. When you think about it, okay, well, Frankenstein's supposed to be our villain, but let's look at what the spoof did. Um, he when he gives him that whole speech, he he tells him what he needs to hear, what he wants to hear, and uh, and even though it's it comes off as a joke, when you realize that he's he's telling he's telling all this to a man who's essentially handicapped. And uh, that's how, uh, that's how that whole scene works. And he's not wrong, either. You that's know, just, the beauty of it. You know, I just realized something. Hmm. In a weird, twisted kind of way, it would have been more interesting if the blind man was the villain of that movie. <laughs> <laughs> like yes. all this innocent stuff, just a big ruse. <laughs> Wait, oh, and that big espresso. <laughs> espresso is just like a blotch of acid. <laughs> no, in that movie. <laughs> In that movie, villain the villain is society, like you said. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, oh. Uh, full circle. You were in a circle, man, a circle. <laughs> Kill oh, the monster! Oh, another one, Apocalypse Now. We don't see the villain until like the last third of the film. Yeah. Mm hmm. I mean, you're wondering what's up with Marlon Brando. What are they building up to? And they mentioned, oh, he's done horrible things. He's done horrible things. And when you realize what happened. The fact that he made this weird ass cult, and you just see how twisted and manipulative and disturbing it is, you start to realize this is a really fucked up dude. So it makes sense why he gets killed at the end. Because his philosophies are so ass backwards. And in that movie, it feels, it seems kind of like there's not much. There's not much difference between the hero and the villain, at least in the way that they're portrayed or played. Yeah. 
the 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 hero is someone who's so clearly tormented by war that it seems like uh, it seems like he doesn't know anything better. Which, if you take that guy, and I say this with all with utmost respect, because uh, because uh, you know I love our troops, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, they put uh, uh, they put uh, so much on the line, so much sacrifice. Um, with guys like this this is why this is why we had uh so much shell shock coming back after um uh coming back after the war because if you take that guy who who lives and breathes war put him in any other situation he can very well easily be a villain yeah and those are the kind of war movies I do like, like Bridge on the River Kwai, where the aspects of war can either damage or torment someone mentally or scar them. Full Metal Jacket, um, just to name a few. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, Kubrick has a few other villains as well, besides Jack. Um, Hell 9000, Alex from Clockwork Orange. Barry <laughs> Lyndon, which is pretty much the Black Adder movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and let's not forget Haley Joel Osment in AI. Oh, uh, uh, he was—he's just a child. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm just saying. I was just saying that to mess with you. I know, I know. Society was the villain with that one. <laughs> Society what? was the villain. One must always blame society. Down with the man. Down with society. It's true what they say. Society is to blame. Kind is society. <laughs> Gotta love Paul Lynch, the penguin. Uh, we can wrap this up. Any final thoughts? Any other villains that are underrated or nothing we never mentioned before? You can name them right now. Well, if there are villains I'd love to hang out with, it's definitely the Gremlins. This could be some really good drinking buddies. <laughs> nice. drink. Now, those some interesting villains. You don't know if they just want to take over the world or just say, fuck it, we're just going to enjoy life. We don't know if they want to take over humanity or just be what they want to be. They just want to party, dude. Yeah. They're teenagers. They just, uh, they just love anarchy that's what it's about mm-hmm. as much as much as i disagree with stefan i'll give him this much he did bring up an interesting point he sees the gremlins as almost like teenagers taking over that roman rockwell kind of town and it's kind of interesting how the way they interact and stuff they're just like 13 year olds and 50 year olds just tearing up the town you know greaser style and stuff yeah rebels I mean, without a cause it's pushing it, but it's like, yeah, in one light, I can kind of see where he means by that. Just the way they're in the movie theater and stuff. Mm-hmm. So how about villains that suck? Mm. Yeah, that's actually a really good question. What are villains that really don't do their job justice or fail? I mean, most villains do fail at the end because the hero prevails you know, against them, but there's some villains that really suck. Maybe if you think like, I don't know, um, Cobra Commander from GI Joe. <laughs> I am just, uh, Joseph Corbett Levitt. What happened to you? Hey, 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 hey! It could be worse. He could have been Randy Quaid in Home on the Range. <laughs> now there's, now there's a bad villain. There is a bad villain. What's the motivation? Everybody hates is the old one. So he goes out and becomes the Pied Piper, capturing cows and stuff and buying off land. Uh, how about how about Shredder? Yeah, He's not very I good at his job. I, but I don't want to conquer Dimension X. I want to conquer Earth. I want to conquer Earth. <laughs> yeah. As long as we're going the, the Saturday morning cartoon route here. Yeah. Uh, Good way to end he's, 
He's uh, kind of a terrible villain. Uh, he he dresses the part, but how effective is he? Best best variation of a Disney villain, Radigan, from the Great Mouse Detective. Best intentionally bad Disney villain that's meant to be taken funny, the King from Robin Hood. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, again, again, God. intentionally bad. Intentionally bad. Yes, yes, intentionally bad. Because he does his job, but he's also very pitiful. Oh, yeah. I agree. Let's see what else. I mean, Disney villains, goddamn, there's so many of those as well. (laughs) (laughs) Or how about worst? Okay. I I haven't seen that movie in a while. I haven't seen that movie in a while. I gotta rewatch that. I remember loving it a lot as a kid. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I was addicted to it. Oh, yeah. How about. Okay, so if you want an idea of worst villains, how about pretty much every uh, every Disney Channel villain ever? No one makes fun of El Capitan. <laughs> Gold. Gold. <laughs> yes, I'm paying gold card. <laughs> They're just. Oh, I'll get sorry. those gummy bears. <laughs> I'm sorry, they're just weak and forgettable. Look at the. Uh, Less than two minutes. Is there is there a Disney Channel villain worth naming? Ooh, ooh, ooh. what about the principal in the Breakfast Club? Is he a villain? <laughs> ooh, ooh, I f- like. No, he's just doing his job. That's, yeah, again. It's true, but again, sympathetic villain. Because he has that scene where he's about to beat up Bender, and then he later regrets, and he talks to the janitor about it. Bender, 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 Bender. <laughs> I mean, yeah, school figure, school authority, I mean, or any kind of authority in yeah. general. And after that, he's just like, screw this, I'm going to go become a police chief. Uh, or uh, how, about, how about another school principal, Mr. Rooney from Paris Bueller's Day Off? <laughs> that, Talk that about fall. a bet, a villain that's bad at their job. Fun fact: John John Hughes went with Jeffrey Jones because of his role in Amadeus, because he's so neat and clean and uphanding. Mm-hmm. Ah, yes. Nice. And need and need we not forget Jareth from Labyrinth? Oh, <laughs> oh yes, yes. Yeah. He's a good villain. Mm-hmm. You don't know whether they should be on his side or not. He just wants to get into some 15-year-old panties. And he'll kidnap Baby Waldo again to do it. <laughs> I mean, Jennifer Kylie. Uh, uh. When, we were, when we were that age, yes. And of course, the, the, the uh, Return to Oz had the Gnome King. Oh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, Mom, Mom be scared the shit out of me. We all know that. I, I'm not... Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll give you that one, but man, no one can get transformed into anything. Ten, He's claymation. Nine, eight, I guess. Seven. Will six, Benton, how five, evil is that? Four, three, <laughs> two. Not as evil as one. Matt. <laughs> Look, it does move in herds. <laughs> Matt does move in a herd. <laughs> oh, uh, no, we should go the other way. Matt's coming the other way. He's moving in herd. He's moving in herd. Matt moves in herd, people. It moves in herd. <laughs> um, Get Cat Morty Audi on the line. Statue you knows how to deal with it. Yes, that is the end of the podcast, folks. Um, uh, yes, this is all about movie villains. We've talked about a lot. What is your favorite movie villain or least favorite movie villain? Please leave a comment below. Make sure you subscribe for more podcasts. I'd like to thank the panel here, James, Cody, and especially a surprise from Morgan. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys, for discussing the movie villains with me tonight. Yeah. Um, so next time, we are actually going to celebrate the five-year anniversary of Cinema Royale by doing a special commentary on Jurassic Park next week. So that's... Well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to be uh, watching the movie and yep. commentaring slash riffing on it. Yep, indeed. Okay. Yep, just doing a little something different besides a normal podcast. We're gonna, It's next week because that's like actual day when the first episode of this podcast was uploaded on February 9th. 
in uh, 2013, so we're going to celebrate five years by doing that. Hey, Waldorf, I bet you one dollar will be live. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, a week from today. A week. One week. A week from today. One week. Okay. So yes. I'm checking my schedule. Yes, checking check, my schedule. checking it out because we can't do it in two weeks because one person has obligations. So hopefully I'm going to try to get Andy Snyder to come on to commentate with us and maybe other people. Wait, 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 wait. Is that the guy had the Lucille badge or is that somebody else? Andy Snyder is the man who's known for foreign flicks with David Rose. He was the, he's been a uh, reoccurring host on the podcast since. Okay. okay. Then, so I'm just thinking. Okay, so I was thinking of someone else then. Yep. So uh, my uh, my uh, schedule. Okay. All right. Still, double check your schedules because we're trying to make this a thing. Um, I will try to rip the movie for everyone in the. In the crew to uh, download and get ready for as we watch it next week. And uh, yeah, if you like this episode, please give us a big like and uh, share this to anybody who likes movie villains and continue the discussions anywhere else. Facebook, Twitter, whatever, share it. And uh, yeah, that's what's happening next time. Thank you for watching and good night, folks. Bye. Ciao for now. I'm back, motherfuckers. <laughs> was a rotating chair. What the fuck did I get this Christmas? <laughs> Help you cycloptic jackass. He needs an old priest and a young priest. The power of Christ compels you. The power of Christ compels you. Oh, hello. Alright. Sick as a dog. Okay. <sighs>